Chopin Etudes are Mount Everest of piano playing. To reach the summit, it takes years of training. How do we get there? I have some solutions for you. My name is Marina Lomazov, and I'm currently a professor of piano at the Eastman School of Music. In this video, we're gonna talk about seven practice strategies. I personally guarantee, if you use all seven of them, you're gonna be a much stronger, much more fluent, much better pianist. Practice strategy number one, grouping. Here, Chopin himself emphasizes a different note in the same grouping. Each time he comes back to the same grouping, it's as if he knows that that's a good thing to do. So by practicing, just playing his pattern, here it is with emphasis on the first note. And going back. Now, emphasis is on F. And notice that when I say emphasis, I don't actually accent it. I inflect it. You don't ever want to put too strong of an accent. That makes it mechanical. Do you hear that? You don't want to do that. So, you inflect. Then the next pattern comes. But he only gives you two positions. The one that emphasizes A and the one that emphasizes F. In order to practice this pattern with more ways, you might want to emphasize the G. And then it will naturally come to emphasize the other note that is not written in Chopin's original score, the C. Now, what does that do? Again, it promotes your hand to learn some new gestures by leaning on a note that is different from what you're used to. The hand moves slightly differently, and that's good the brain starts more actively thinking about how it moves. Practice strategy number two, lucky. That happens to be one of my favorite ones and I employ it very often. I don't wanna call it staccato because I notice that when I say to the students, okay, play these notes staccato, they raise their hand halfway to the, to the sky and then they have to lower it back. That's just uneconomical hand movement. Plucking is simply releasing the key as fast as you can. You, you play the key and then you let the key come up really, really fast. Now the mechanism in the piano is ingenious. If you just don't hold the key down, it'll come up as fast as you struck it down. And that results in basically a staccato sound, even though it might not feel necessarily staccato. So I call it plucking or releasing notes really fast. Let me demonstrate this using opus 10 number four. Two notes up, then skip down two notes up. Now that sounds a little bit mechanical to my ear. So again, I rewrite the grouping. I start just the four groups, the four notes that go up. So I skip the first two notes and I think of the grouping as and then I have to change the groupings once again because the, the, the next pattern is, is kind of presenting a different uh, configuration. But this is how I would practice um, this etude and especially especially when it, when it comes to left hand. Now, again, referring back to my first practice strategy grouping, it promotes your hand to move in a different way than if you were thinking two notes up, then skip two notes, two notes up again. I mean, the hand kind of jerks around. In this way, 
it just goes up smoothly in nice neat in nice neat patterns of groups of four practice strategy number three hold and pluck it's not like hold them texas style it's hold and pluck sometimes the fingers stubbornly refuse to be even and that especially happens around arpeggios we can also apply the same practice strategy to chopin etude opus 10 number one another everest that everybody wants to climb and oh my god it is so difficult to climb it so you start the same way the arpeggios are much wider than the ones in journey but it this method promotes both finger strength and knowing the distances between any two notes there are combinations on this practice strategy you can do. You can hold one note and pluck strike the next two notes. Now that's very effective. And you can do that once, you can do it twice. Um, you can do it three times, triplets. forth if you combine this strategy with the two previous strategies now obviously the plucking one or releasing the note very fast you apply it here you just add holding the previous note to that but also the groupings if you do that and think of different ways to group the notes for instance you start with a second note And you, you combine the two next notes in different ways, or you vary the number of repetitions that you do for each note. You build on the vocabulary, the, the, the alphabet of practice regiments that you can vary. It's very important to vary the practice regiments. Anyone is effective for just so long, and then the body and the mind get used to it, and it's like it stops working, it stops being as effective. So, constantly renewing the regiment of practice strategies and combining them in different ways to make your brain work actively is very important. Practice strategy number four, rhythms. This method applies absolutely directly to Chopin Opus 25 number two. And then you can do the reverse of that. What's nice about this method, and by the way, you don't only have to do short, long or long, short. You can do long, two shorts. Or you can do any other combination of short, long, short, 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 long, long, short, short, long, short, 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 and so forth. What's nice about the rhythms is it also prompts you to think of the passage work in different groupings. You start hearing it not like you usually hear it when you just play it through, but in different inflection combinations. And that's also good for the mind. It starts to go into all the crevices and turns and twists of this very intricate melodic finger work. And by doing that, it learns it better and it makes you feel more confident playing it. Now, the rhythms also promote another trait in your hand that is really useful for the hand. It gives the hand the opportunity to feel how the weight balances on a different um, note in a passage, 
the one that's going to be long, the one that the hand will pause on. So the weight will have a chance to collect on that note and some of the tension will have a chance to be released. Releasing tension on different note in your practice regimen is a very, very good thing. And mixing up which note gets the tension released on is very good, which is why we use the variety of the patterns, short, long, long, short, short, long, long, short, short, long, long, short, short, and so forth. So in doing so, I feel my weight releasing on this note, on this note, and so forth. And then when I mix it up, now the weight releases on the first note, on the thumb, on the fourth finger, when it previously was releasing on the third finger, and the second finger. Practice strategy number five, working backwards. There are always these stubborn passages that no matter what you do with them, they don't yield to you. They, you still make a mistake over and over again. And even when you get it right in a practice room, you bring it on stage and that mistake creeps in again. Sometimes the mind needs real shaking up. It really needs to think about the passage in a different way. And I employed this strategy, which works really well on stubborn passages that are very fast, difficult. Usually they're endings of codas in shop and works. And usually we miss the note towards the end. We never miss the one towards the beginning. Uh, towards the end, the brain just gets tired and stops thinking fast. And so we tend to miss the last note. That's why I like to work backwards. I like to practice that last note first to make sure that I firmly have it in my ears and in my hands, and then I work backwards from it. To demonstrate that, I'm going to take a passage in Black Key Etude. You know the one I'm talking about. Opus 10, number five. God, I dread that passage. If you wanted to master that passage, I would start with the last grouping, or maybe even the last two notes. Let me say at this point that the rapidity of repetition matters. If you repeat it and then you stop and get a glass of water, that repetition will not count. It won't do anything. So if you want to repeat it five to seven times, you want to do it in the row, in kind of a loop. And then at some point in the repetition, I notice that I'm doing it kind of mechanically. Hmm, I don't like that. So I'm going to go back to my preface, play everything musically. I'm going to give it a nice little inflection. And in my practice, I constantly have to monitor myself from when I practice something really, really technical to still do it musically. So what I'm saying to you, I am not immune to. I know how it feels to just zero in on technical difficulties and forget about music. But that's very important. Practice strategy number six, repeat attacks. Now this is a variation on the earlier practice strategy, the one that we called plucking. The plucking, I will remind you, is very quickly releasing the key so it springs back up. And by the way, that also means your finger springs back up as well, but it doesn't leave the key. You don't have to spring, hop spring uh, too far. You stay in the key and then you just release the key very quickly. The variation on that, what does it do? The repeat attack is basically plucking the same note several times rapidly. In this case, I do it three times in a row. You can do it twice. You can do it more than three. That's kind of 
hard. I'm beginning to notice that my repetition is not very even. And to make it more even, I'll practice that. And that will really prompt finger independence, which is really what this practice strategy is centering on. It, it makes you use this tiny little muscle in your finger um, very efficiently and very rapidly, and it promotes its independence. So this practice strategy builds on the previous ones, the plucking, the grouping, but it also really burrs in into making sure each individual finger works independently. And that's really important when we do small technique and we do um, small passage work. Which one comes to mind? One of the most notoriously difficult one, Chopin Opus 10 number two. Now, to start learning that one, I would probably start with the single note plucking and maybe not just plucking, but also just playing it legato while releasing the other two in accord of the, of the downbeats, of the strong beats. It's surprisingly difficult to talk and play at the same time. But once you kind of got a hang of the fingering and how the etude goes, to strike each note two or three times, I think would be invaluable to promote this sort of tiny, tiny little movements between the fingers that have to go so, so rapid and so evenly. As a bonus, it also promotes releasing the other two notes in the chord, which you may not think you're doing it, but I guarantee you one of those chords, your thumb gets stuck on. It gets a little bit heavy, and it gets stuck and then you can't move forward. So this ensures that, that your thumb clears the note and allows your hand to move forward. Finally, practice strategy number seven, slow practice. You probably think to yourself, whoa, whoop to do slow practice. Well, I've done it all my life. Yeah, me too. I would um, play it something like this. This is, um, Opus 740 of Cherny number four. When I was a kid, I would do that, somehow thinking that emphasizing every single note will miraculously lead to a better technique. Well, unfortunately I'm older, but fortunately I am wiser. So now I know it doesn't. So slow practice in my mind now means really musical playing. At any tempo, you try to shape the phrases, you try to hear the melodic line, and you try to avoid accents of any kind that are not part of your musical thinking. To extrapolate that practice into something that I've done quite a bit of which is the notoriously difficult third Chopin etude, opus 25, number six. I have to tell you a little story because that's what really got me thinking about slow practice in a whole new way. Apparently, there was a reporter that really wanted to get an interview with Rachmaninoff. And so he came all the way to Switzerland where Rachmaninoff and his family had a summer house and he was always turned away saying, Maestro's practicing, he is not to be disturbed. And so one day, the reporter didn't leave the house. He crept around to the back to where Rachmaninoff's studio was, and he crouched behind the window. He thought to himself, now I'm really going to find all the secrets of the greatest pianist of our lifetime. I'm going to listen to Rachmaninoff practice. Rachmaninoff happened to be practicing the third's etude. And as the story goes, reporter said he sat there for 45 minutes and all Rachmaninoff did was this.
I bet you're already getting tired, right? You're getting sleepy. You want to do something else. Check your email, maybe. Well, this was 45 minutes of this. He never moved from that spot. He kept playing the thirds really slowly and doing whatever he was doing, listening to something that the reporter with his probably less trained ear could not tell what it was. It sounded exactly the same to him for the entire 45 minute period. Then he finally got tired and he left. So that's the story. I read it in a journal when I was a student at Eastman School and I was completely struck by it. I thought to myself, I will try what Rachmaninoff did and I will see how far I can get. Well, I lasted for about five minutes of this slow practice and then I just couldn't take it any longer. I got tired. My mind got tired. But in those five minutes, I heard so much of what was going on with the thirds. I heard that my thirds were uneven. I was... I was emphasizing this or that note. They were not connecting well. My left hand was too loud. Things were not balanced between the right and the left hand. And that's benefit of slow practice. Your mind kind of has time to process what you've just done. And you don't even have to conscientiously or consciously think about it. Your subconscious does a lot of the work. Trust your intuition. Give it a little bit of a rest and do it again and try to pay attention to as many musical details in a way as you can. And you find it being very beneficial. So I tried in five minutes that I had the stamina for fix as many of these things as possible. And then the next day I was quite stubborn in those days. I came back to that slow practice and I lasted a little bit longer, about seven minutes. I never got it up to 45 minute mark that Rachmaninoff endured, I'm sorry to say, but it did me a world of good. And I got the new appreciation for actual slow practice. We all talk about it, but we rarely actually do it. So you've just heard my seven practice strategies. I guarantee you, you eat your vegetables, you drink your vitamins, you do 20 minutes with these practice strategies. In about a month, you're gonna be much healthier person and much better pianist. As with all practice strategies, we don't mean to, but we start focusing on technical things more than we focus on musical things. Then the accents start creeping in. All kinds of things begin to happen. I encourage you to watch for these telltale signs, like a Voldemort sign in the sky. If you crave more, I recorded an extended series of videos on training how to play Chopin etudes. To watch those, subscribe to Tonebase premium platform. And now back to work. <laughs>